Hello everyone. Welcome to the annual Dublin City University Tell It Straight competition for postgraduate research students. This is the eighth Tell It Straight final competition. My name is Professor Joseph Stokes, DCU Dean of Graduate Studies, and I will be your compare today. I'd like to welcome all of you watching this, but especially our finalists. Normally this event would be held on campus, face to face, which we will do in the future. But our Graduate Studies office are delighted to run this virtual event for you. At this point, I want to thank all research students who entered the competition. Our finalists, our DCU president, our judges, my Graduate Studies office team, those who helped with this production, and especially Linda Proso of GSO for making this happen today. Today's event will run as follows. We will have a brief message from our DCU president. I will introduce the judges, then I'll introduce each category presentation. That's category one, students from year one only, category two, students from year two onwards. And then finally, we will see the video presentations from all years, and that's category three. After that, we will announce the winners. So now I will pass you over to Professor Dara Kyo, president of Dublin City University. Thanks, Dara. Uh, hello everybody and welcome and congratulations to the finalists of this year's Tell It Straight competition. Uh, this is the eighth year that this competition has run and delighted to see that the applicant pool this year is larger than ever. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for you to showcase your research, the importance of your research and your own contribution. It's also, I suppose, from a selfish point of view, an opportunity for you to develop your own exposure, your profile, and to enhance and polish your communication skills. All of those things are important in terms of your career progression and development. The, the research is the, is the key point here. COVID has challenged us in so many ways, but one of the benefits, I suppose, in the long term in terms of education and research is that society appreciates science, I think, uh, in a way that it hasn't before, that the scientists have been to the fore. Uh, knowledge uh, trumps ignorance, and research, thankfully, and science has trumped fake news. Um, here at the university, we've played our part um, you will, of course, be aware of the uh, impact of the COVID research hub uh, and the way in which it responded really quickly to the challenges of the pandemic, uh, offering uh, science-based responses and uh, avenues and ways out of this crisis that we face. Um, I'm very grateful and very proud of everybody in the university, but today is the opportunity to celebrate, to tell it straight, and all of you who've reached this final. I'd like to congratulate everybody who embraced the Tell It Straight Challenge, and especially like to congratulate the finalists. As I say, it's an opportunity for you to showcase your research, the importance of what you do, and particularly for maybe friends and lay people who wouldn't have an insight into what you do every day here at the university. It's a great opportunity for us to celebrate you uh, and to celebrate your supervisors who've supported you. So thank you to um, all our finalists. Thank you to your supervisors. I'd like especially to thank the uh, external judges. I'd like to thank from Skillnet Ireland, Anthony McCauley, Maria Delaney, uh, who's joined us from Noteworthy, and Nora Trench-Bowles from the Irish University Association. So can I wish all of the finalists the very best of luck um, wish the rest of you uh, every success as you move forward, forward with your research. Just again to remember that COVID has been challenging. The isolation has challenged us in ways that we couldn't have imagined. Uh, I hope that you've, you've come through it together. Uh, and just to urge you again to reach out to fellow researchers and people around you who may be lonely uh, and isolated at this time. So today is a, a big day for us. Congratulations to the finalists uh, and all the very best uh, for the remainder of the competition. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Now I'll introduce the judging panel. Mr. Anthony McCauley, Ms. Maria Delaney and Ms. Nora Trench-Bowles. 
Mr. Anthony McCauley is a strategic advisor for Skillnet Ireland. He was a former head of research at Fujitsu Ireland, and he is the chairman of the Technology Ireland Innovation Forum. And Anthony is a former DCU graduate with a BSc in Information Technology and an MSc in Internet Systems. Ms. Maria Delaney is an investigative journalist for Noteworthy, with involvement in such sources as the Journal.ie. Maria was shortlisted for the prestigious Mary Rafter Prize in 2020. She won the Association of British Science Writers Newcomer Award in 2015. And Maria is also a former DCU graduate with a MA in Journalism and other degrees like a BA Maj Science from TCD and a Professional Diploma in Data Analytics from ICM. And finally, we have Ms. Nora trench Bowles. Nora is Head of Lifelong Learning, Skills and Quality at the Irish Universities Association. Nora previously worked in EU affairs in Brussels, Strasbourg and Dublin. Nora graduated with Erasmus Mundus double MA degree from Uppsala University in Sweden and the University of Strasbourg in France and holds a BA International Honours degree from UCD. I mentioned earlier that this is the 8th Telestrate competition. We had hoped to hold this event in spring 2020, but it had to be postponed until now due to the COVID pandemic. Initially, we received a large volume of applications, which had to be shortlisted. And I want to thank our shortlisting judges, Professor Regina Connolly and Dr. Patrick Murphy for helping us with this. Normally in categories one and two, each student would present their projects in a face-to-face -face setting, but these were adapted for an online virtual delivery today for you. I will introduce the finalists from each category ahead of each section. Now I will introduce the finalists from Category 1, the oral presentations from Year 1 only. First we have Paul Mahan, School of STEM Education, Innovation and Global Studies. Then we have Anawisha Mohanty, School of Computing. Then we have Craig Smith, School of Health and Human Performance. After that we'll have Joseph Rogers, School of History and Geography. And finally we'll have Christina O'Keefe, School of Inclusive and Special Education.
At the end of four years of undergraduate training, new graduate nurses leave behind the clinical world they knew as students and step into the real world of clinical practice as registered nurses. Bound by the Code of Professional Conduct and Scope of Practice, these new graduate nurses are now members of an interdisciplinary team caring for sick and dying patients. They are personally and professionally responsible for act and omission, and they are expected to be ready to practice. But undergraduate training only prepares the nurse for initial entry to the professional register. It does not prepare them to be fully ready for each and every clinical setting. It's unsurprising then that a large body of international evidence suggests that new graduates are underprepared for their transition. We know from the literature that new graduates experience problems with basic clinical skills, knowledge, communication, and professional behaviors to name but a few. But we also know that many new graduates lack confidence and suffer what is known as transition shock. In fact, all over the world, many new graduates describe the transition in terms of feeling overwhelmed and stressed, anxious, insecure and inadequate, and lacking in acceptance, respect and sensitivity from their more senior colleagues. And such is the emotionally exhausting nature of this first year of practice that over half express an intention to leave the profession, while over a quarter actually do. Now this is a significant issue, not just for the individual nurse or the service they leave behind, it is also an issue for delivery of healthcare globally. We know that the world is facing a shortage of at least 10 million nurses and in this context alone, losing a quarter of all our graduates is a problem and it is a problem that will likely affect us all. But adding to the problem is that despite what we do know, we still have an incomplete picture of what it means to be practice ready, especially in an Irish context. Indeed, every ward and clinical specialty has their own set of necessary knowledge and skills, meaning that even within any one hospital, there will be different perspectives on what being ready for practice is. Now, as this is a recognised problem, hospitals internationally have implemented support programmes to help the new graduate transition. But again, we don't actually know what the best approach to these programmes is either. My research aims to address these important issues. Using the educational entrepreneurial approach to action research within a mixed methods design, I aim to explore the literature, come to an understanding of what practice readiness means to the new graduate nurse, experienced nurses and other key stakeholders, and then use this data to create a bespoke transition support program and then study if this program has helped transform the transition experience of the new graduate nurse and the perceptions of the experienced nurses. Now I've told you why this is important for the individual nurse and for healthcare in general, but why is it important to me? Well, as a nurse, I believe that we must treat patients with compassion, care and commitment. As a nurse educator, I believe that if we want to fully realise the potential of our most junior colleagues, then we must equally treat them with the same compassion, care and commitment that we expect them to exhibit in practice. As a researcher, I believe that we must be creative, reflexive and values based when trying to solve such socially situated problems. President, deans, esteemed judges, fellow finalists, faculty and friends, much has been done on this important topic but there's more that we must know and do and that's why I feel this research is important. It is important because it has implications for undergraduate and postgraduate education and training. It is important because it has implications for health policy and health management. It is important because it fundamentally impacts on the working lives of our graduates and by default, the quality of the care they provide to patients. It is important because how we train and support new graduates in Ireland differs to other countries and we need to know what works best for us. But the how of this research is equally important and that's why I have chosen an approach that is egalitarian creative and concerned with the potential for human development. I have chosen an approach that allows me to frame the research around my values as a nurse, my values as an educator and my values as a person. And in the midst of a global pandemic that has so far killed almost two and a half million people, such research has never been more important to ensure that new graduates are better ready for practice, but equally important that practice is better ready for new graduates.
So why are skin diseases considered for this computer science research? Because according to the report published by National Center for Biotechnology Information, NCBI, in 2017, it is the fourth leading cause of non-fatal diseases worldwide. Skin diseases cause discomfort in day-to-day -day life. This get worse with time reduce productivity and if these are not taken care of from the earlier stage, they can be deadly. Hence, these need early detection and medication. Well, let's focus on rosacea because this is the particular skin condition I am mainly looking at in my research and a few other skin conditions that may look similar to rosacea. Rosacea is a chronic skin condition that goes through the cycle of fading and relapse. It is a common skin condition in people with fair skin or Celtic origins. According to an article published by the National Rosacea Society in 2018, there are 415 million people affected by rosacea worldwide. So now I'm going to show a few motivating factors for this research. According to the Irish Medical Times and Irish Skin Foundation, there is one dermatologist per 100,000 population in Ireland. Another report by HSE, there is only one dermatologist per 193,000 population in HSE South, Ireland, while we need at least one dermatologist per 62,500 people to provide an effective service. Likewise, in Canada, there are 1.4 dermatologists per 100,000 population and in the UK there is one dermatologist per 100,000 population. According to the report published by JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2016 American Academy of Dermatology database, there are almost 3.4 dermatologists per 100,000 population. So, as we can see, this research is important in speeding up the diagnosis process for healthcare professionals such as general practitioners and dermatologists. Hence, I am working on a solution to contribute towards the early diagnosis of skin conditions by applying AI and computer vision techniques. So, what is AI and computer vision? AI, artificial intelligence, can imitate human intelligence being human-like rather than becoming human. Furthermore, computer vision is about automating tasks that human visual system can do. Here are a few examples of AI and computer vision in medical diagnosis such as a skin cancer detection and a brain tumor segmentation. My research is about creating a 3D model from a 2D image, measuring height and depth of lesions, labeling different regions of the face, and finally applying explainable AI by which the system can explain how it reached its diagnosis. Here is an example of how a 3D model can be created from a 2D image so that the diagnosis of rosacea can be effective. It will help in labeling different regions of the face to detect the severity of rosacea, which may need early diagnosis. Well, the possible impact of my research will be increasing cost effectiveness in medical diagnosis, improving transparency of the system, enabling the faster treatment, and monitoring the progress of the treatment by creating a skin health database. In the future, a broader range of dermatological conditions can be considered and a virtual clinic for skin conditions can be created. This will be an aid towards the early diagnosis of skin conditions, improving well-being. It may also give scope for commercialization. So, the more futuristic example for cross-checking a diagnosis will be a doctor asking a patient that if you want a second opinion, I will ask my computer. Thank you very much. I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, I'm not another person that's going to lecture me on how I need to be healthy. But unfortunately, unhealthy behaviors are still becoming more and more prevalent. 
And this is despite all the information on health that's constantly shown to us in the media. And what is most worrying is that we're starting to see these unhealthy behaviours at younger ages all the time. And the behaviours that I'm talking about are the usual suspects, the ones you can see here on the slide. These behaviours are resulting in an increased risk of cancer, heart disease, lung disease and diabetes. And these are responsible for over 70% of deaths worldwide, which is crazy. 7 in 10 people die as a result of one of these diseases. And the main reason for developing such diseases is our lifestyle choices. Having a look closer to home then, the picture isn't much better. Roughly 60% of the population is overweight or obese in Ireland. And we are currently en route to become the most obese nation in Europe by 2030. But we know this. We know that obesity is an issue. We know that eating too much or not exercising regularly, regularly is bad for us. But why haven't we been able to improve these trends? Because improving health behaviours is very difficult. And this quote sums it up perfectly. I'm sure we can all relate. We've all probably at some point tried to improve our bad habits, maybe as a New Year's resolution, and we realised how difficult it can be. But why is it so difficult? It's because negative behaviours become embedded within us. And without getting too much into the psychology behind that, our brain is constantly looking for that kick of dopamine or that kick of happiness that these behaviours give us. So what do we do then? Well, we've got to do something before these behaviours become embedded. And the window, the window of opportunity to do so is adolescence. Adolescence is a time when behaviours start to stick and then they track with us right through to adulthood. And it's important to note that it's not just negative behaviours that start to form, it's also positive behaviours. But as we know, the adolescent or teenage years can be difficult at the best of times. None more so than in today's world, where youth are constantly exposed to targeted ads, fake news on social media, they have access to fast food at the touch of a button, and everywhere you look, there's something in a teenager's environment promoting an unhealthy behaviour. So how do we help teenagers to dodge all of these obstacles that they are faced with and then develop these healthier habits? But one possible solution is health literacy. And health literacy is defined as an individual's ability to find, understand, critically appraise, and then apply health information. It's a resource. It's a resource that empowers individuals to make informed health-related decisions in everyday life. And I'm not talking about someone going away and reading a scientific journal and understanding it. It's about the stuff that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that be scrolling through our phones, whether that be when we're exposed to a targeted advert, whether that be when reading something online. It's a skill set that can be applied when and where needed, which is vital given the difficulties that adolescents are faced with in today's society. Individuals who are more health literate are more likely to have developed healthier behaviours and ultimately have better health outcomes. So providing adolescents with the tools to become more health literate provides them with greater opportunity to make better health choices. And although the evidence is strong in terms of the benefits of developing or increasing our health literacy, there is little research looking at ways to actually improve health literacy, and particularly in youth. So that's where we come in. We're developing an adolescent health literacy intervention. So what will this intervention look like then? And I'll start with the who. We're focusing on the disadvantaged schools because we know that individuals from these areas are more likely to adopt unhealthy behaviours. To be effective, what will the intervention need to be? Well, first and foremost, it needs to be educational. And in particular, it needs to develop health literacy skills. It needs to be tailored to the needs and it needs to be contextual so that the students can relate. But also, it needs to be engaging, it needs to be motivating, and ultimately it needs to be something different, something that's going to disrupt the normal habits that are forming. So how will we do that then? So what we've come up with and are currently developing is LifeLab. And LifeLab is this interactive hands-on experience here in DCU where students will have the opportunity to take part in various engaging exhibits. These exhibits will allow the students to explore their own health with cool measuring devices, but also it will allow students to explore factors in their environment that influence their health, whether that be using technology to explore the impacts of social media on the brain or see what happens in the body when we're physically inactive. It's these kind of ideas. It's a completely different experience to what they're used to. But me or my colleagues, we don't know what a 12 to 15 year old finds fun and engaging, so we need them to help us design it. And that's exactly what we're doing. We are co-designing this whole life lab experience to, to, to ensure that it's something that they will enjoy and it's relevant to their context.
O'Connell Street is the primary urban thoroughfare within both Dublin City and the Republic of Ireland. It is a shared environment, a common public space which acts as the civic heart of the capital. Sackville Street, as it was then known, was constructed from a complicated social, commercial, political and cultural fabric, and in the 19th century, the street was established as the Athenian Agora, or Roman Forum, of Dublin City. An inviting space, which was the termini for most tram routes throughout the city, the area fulfilled retail, commercial and cultural desires for an expanding city and growing cultural middle-class consumers society, while it also served to provide employment for some of its working classes. Additionally, the street evolved to serve more than mere commercial means. Acting as a space of civil protest and public commemoration, O'Connell Street was and remains the de facto urban assembly space to gravitate towards. The street has served this purpose for Dublin residents and visitors for over a century and a half, yet its beginnings and first 100 years were very different. The street was constructed as an exclusive residential estate for the wealthy and for the nobility. Sackville Street, or Sackville Mall, was constructed on part of the former Drogheda Street. Drogheda Street was part of a wider urban development in the area formerly occupied by St Mary's Abbey and named for Henry Moore, the Earl of Drogheda. The development of Sackville Street was unique in the city given its width, designed to incorporate a mall for socialising and for playing a precursor of croquet. By the late 1780s, the residential fabric of the street had begun to decline and the disappearance of the mall coincided with plans to extend the street to the river with commercial units in the 1790s. The development, including the construction of a new bridge across the Liffey and the creation of new streets and quays on both banks of the river, permanently altered the urban matrix of Dublin city centre. A new north-south axis swept through the city from the canals and circular roads across the river at Sackville Street, and the central area soon attracted footfall and commerce en masse. The area offered high-end goods and services to shoppers across a variety of industries, including food and drink, clothing and fashion, fancy goods, jewellery, clocks and watches, and professional services such as solicitors, doctors, architects and brokers. The street demoted the primacy of Capel Street as a shopping street and became the first dedicated retail and commercial precinct in Dublin City. However, the construction of the Nelson Pillar and the General Post Office cemented the newly developed street as the de facto commercial and civic heart of the city, ever more obvious when noted that the milestones pointing travellers to Dublin City measured the distance as to the GPO. This area gave rise to a new public space which had previously been a private one. Dublin Castle was never a public space and Stevens Green offered little to satisfy the consumer while College Green with its Protestant Parliament, Protestant University and love their old statue of King William was never attractive to Catholics or Nationalists. Crucially, Sackville Street presented itself as a shared public space which transcended class, wealth, religion and to a more progressive degree, national identity. Following Catholic emancipation and the removal of the ban on Catholics in Dublin Corporation, Sackville Street became a gallery or stage of sorts where a contested unionist and Catholic nationalist struggle for the shape of a national identity was played out. As Dublin historian David Dixon has noted, it was appropriate then that the building which was erected to cement communications between the Union of Britain and Ireland of 1801 was selected as the HQ of a radical nationalist effort to break that union in 1916. Sackville Street was largely destroyed in 1916 and during the Irish Civil War in 1922, yet it was reconstructed and remains the most prominent physical urban scar of the Irish Revolutionary period. Despite retaining its status as the principal urban public space within the Irish state, the street's aura has grown dim as has the calibre of many of its commercial units. More must be done to revive the area, to ensure it retains a fabric of mixed usage as an urban centre of commerce, culture and as a working living space where people traverse the area and the city. This research aims to produce a work which will inform and add to the debate regarding the future of the street, and particularly in context with other historic high streets in other cities which are facing similar problems. Lastly, this research will help us to understand how the street became our principal public urban space. Thank you.
Before we begin, I want you to think back to your own childhood memories with your friends. Hopefully, play formed a key part of these memories. I know for me, they certainly did. From playing with our high-tech Barbie house with my friend Rachel, to simply playing with a cardboard box. Whilst play can be conceptualised in many different ways, my research is interested in this inherent socially interactive nature of play, based on this transaction or exchange with another. But you might be thinking, it's just play, right? Actually, play is widely recognised as fundamental in early childhood development. Described as the currency of early childhood, it is the primary means through which children engage and interact and develop lifelong social interaction skills, including peer acceptance or the degree of social popularity by peers and friendships, from Barton Milhouse to Anna and Elsa, and Rachel and I, who picked up some more friends along the way, minus a few teeth. However, children on the autism spectrum experience differences in their play. These include an increase in solitary or alone play behaviours, as well as challenges in socially interactive play in groups. Such differences are often compounded by difficulties in social communication, a key defining feature of ASD, in particular in navigating social relationships. However, increasing evidence is emerging around the benefits of providing structure and support to help children on the autism spectrum to access play. Such differences may result in isolation, peer rejection and bullying, whereby children on the autism spectrum often remain on the periphery of classroom social interactive experiences, which may continue throughout their formal schooling. Rather than focusing on a traditional deficit view of such play behaviours as something to be fixed, it is important that we capitalise on the potential of play to act as a medium of social inclusion within the classroom, adopting a systemic approach in order to create a culture of inclusion and acceptance of such differences, not just focusing on children on the autism spectrum, but developing peers' attitudes and understanding. However, despite this potential, this is largely unexplored within the literature. As a result, this research will draw on this potential of play and examine teacher-guided peer play in supporting the social communication and social play of young children on the autism spectrum within the classroom. However, given that the research in this field is very much in its infancy, this will involve a series of sequential phases or steps, each one building on the other in order to gain insight into this under-researched area. First, phase one, which is now complete, which examined the literature in order to establish what we know. Second phase two, which is currently in progress, and examines findings from a national survey I conducted on 381 primary school teachers throughout Ireland based on their attitudes towards play in early childhood education. And finally, phase three, a classroom intervention, the development of which will be informed by findings from these phases. Looking more closely at phase one, which involved examining the evidence base using two separate components. A traditional or narrative review of the literature based on a synthesis of current evidence within the field, which has since been published in Online of Vogue. And a systematic review, which also involved a synthesis of the literature. However, this was based on a very rigorous and transparent process using pre-specified criteria to answer a specific research question, which is currently under peer review. Phase two aims to capture teachers' perspectives surrounding play within the early childhood classroom. Firstly, in relation to the pandemic and the unprecedented times we now find ourselves in, which has been published in the European Early Childhood Education Research Journal, and secondly, in relation to play for inclusion within the classroom context, which is currently underway. Given that little is known about teachers' perspectives surrounding play, this phase provides much needed insight into the current status of play within the classroom in order to effectively plan for data collection as part of phase three. As a result, this phase is very much in its infancy, however, will respond to the urgent need for rigorous classroom-based research within the field and draw out findings from these previous phases in order to design and implement a systemic model, extending beyond children on the autism spectrum to include peers, staff, and the entire classroom culture. In this way, this phase works towards our common goal as a university to transform the lives of societies through education, research, and innovation, and ensure different is not less.
I will now introduce the finalists from Category 2, that's oral presentations from Year 2 onwards. First we have Kleena McParland, DCU Business School. Then we'll have Sarah Dillon, School of Health and Human Performance. After that we'll have Siobhan Woods, School of Psychology. And lastly we'll have Jennifer OKK, School of Nursing, Psychotherapy and Community Health. Imagine a scenario where your employer could track your every move during your workday, every step taken, your exact location and length of stay, when and where you had lunch. What about how many coffee breaks you took, or how many times you needed to visit the restroom, and for how long? Every single day. You might understandably view this as an invasion of your privacy. But now imagine that this information meant your employer knew your precise location to assist you if you were under attack, and enabled them to send colleagues immediately to your aid or likewise send you to the aid of a colleague in distress or to a nearby emergency situation. Welcome to the world of Angarda Shiakana, where senior management are rolling out a wearable tracking technology capable of identifying the real-time location coordinates of each Garda member throughout their workday. The intent is to make Garda safer, increase organisational efficiency and provide us, the public, with a more responsive police force. But in order for such benefits to be realised, the technology must be willingly adopted. Instead, many Gardaí are resisting it. Understanding the legitimate concerns that underpin such resistance and ensuring that improved organisational responsiveness does not jeopardise employee trust is a complex task, and that is the focus of my PhD research. Using a mixed method approach, I undertook Ireland's first ever national public sector data violence study. I explored the privacy concerns and organisational justice perceptions and beliefs of 2,000 Garda members nationwide in relation to their mandatory required use of these location monitoring technologies. I have confirmed the privacy concerns specifically in relation to the collection, use and the potential for misuse of this information has a significant impact on Garda members' relationship with their senior management, which in turn impacts their trust and commitments to the organisation of Angarda Shiakana. Garda members have expressed significant concerns that this information could be used against them as opposed to as a means of assisting them. Concerns it could be used in disciplinary proceedings, Concerns it could be used to build up detailed profiles on them. Concerns it could be used to unfairly target them in some way, or, in more extreme cases, could be used to bully them. My findings have indicated that these concerns have an extremely negative impact on Garda members' relationships with senior management and the organisation of Angarda Shiakana. Sound a bit far-fetched? Maybe not. Information obtained through these location monitoring devices has been used to discipline Garda members, when they've been found to be offside, for example which is the affectionate and somewhat football orientated term Garda members use when a member is somewhere they're not supposed to be. Sounds fair enough there, right? Well, maybe not. What about the Garda member who is disciplined for being offside because he needed diesel for his patrol car while he was on duty? Or the Garda member that was disciplined because he was five minutes late arriving at a checkpoint after getting stuck in traffic? Or what about the Garda member who was disciplined for stopping off at a neighbouring Garda station for a cup of tea and a chat and a catch up with old colleagues? When he was supposed to be at his own station. Perhaps the more important question to ask is, if these technologies are only being used to monitor guard locations to assist them, how were senior managers aware of the minor fractions I just mentioned in the first place? But consider for a moment another perspective. Consider the two guard members who were involved in an unprovoked attack that landed both in hospital. The attack was so sudden and brutal that they were unable to call for assistance. Without the watch rely on their locations, which allow for immediate backup to be sent in their direction, the situation could have been even more dire. Or what about Detective Garda Colin Horkin? Detective Garda Horkin was unlawfully murdered with his own service weapon in the summer of 2020. The ability of senior management to track his exact location meant that immediate assistance could be sent his way when the distress call was received. While it unfortunately did not save his life, their quick response to his exact location meant the perpetrator was caught and reprimanded at scene. My research has identified the need for clear policies and procedures that govern the use of such technologies in the workplace. In fact, the findings of my research will be used by members of Garda and Shiakana management and the representative associations of Garda and Shiakana to draw clear guidelines, policies and procedures relating to the fair use of these and other technologies throughout the force. In this way, senior management of Garda and Shiakana will be able to employ new and innovative technologies in a way 
that enhances Garda members' trust and management and commitment to the force, while allowing them to meet the strategic objectives and goals of Angarda Sheikhana, which is to protect and assist both the members of Angarda Sheikhana and protect and serve us, the Irish public. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah and I've spent the past three years uncovering why runners get injured. If you're looking at me a little like this right now, I understand. We've all heard about the benefits that running brings to your heart health, your bone health and your mental health. But why do overall more people run than do any other sport? My reason isn't a why, it's a who. Meet Mike. Mike was my roommate for a couple of years after college and as well as taking a great selfie, Mike loves to run. So one day he dragged me from what had become my habitat on the couch to the great outdoors for a run. But don't let that sweet face fool you. After four months of running, I would receive this. I know, right? Mike had signed us up for a half marathon. It turns out that my expectations were a little different from my reality. And unlike Mike, who seems injury proof, I was soon out of action. And I became one of the almost 80% of runners who get injured each year. This isn't a good look for a physio who usually doles out injury advice. So me and my injured knee began to ask why. When I was lying on my couch yet again and an ad for a PhD on running injuries popped up, I was in. One of the main proposed theories as to why we get injured concerns the loading through our body as we run. When we run, we hit the ground on average of 160 times per minute. This causes a force to go up through our body of about two to three times our body weight. If the tissues in our body, like the muscles, the bones, the ligaments and the tendons, aren't strong enough to cope with the force, they break and we get injured. Some studies have looked at measuring this load going up through the body and the factors that might affect how we absorb the load in order to better understand the risk factors for running injuries. But this research isn't without problems, leading to mixed messages that can be confusing for runners and clinicians. The first problem is that studies usually only involve a small number of participants, which might reduce how generalizable the results are. Secondly, factors proposed to be related to injuries are usually studied in isolation, which doesn't allow us to figure out if a combination of factors might be important. And lastly, most of the studies have looked at runners who are already injured, which makes it unclear whether the factor we are studying caused the injury or was as a result of it. And so there was a gap in the research. By reading up on the most common risk factors for injury, we were able to come up with a recipe for running injuries. These were things that we thought might in isolation or combined lead to injury. They included things that can be easily measured by a physio or athletic therapist, like flexibility, how flat our feet are, our muscle strength, our previous injury history, and then things that are a little bit more complex to measure, but might potentially be the future of predicting injuries, like our running technique and also how hard we hit the ground, which can be measured using these little devices that you see here. Knowing that this would be one of the biggest studies of its kind, I was really excited. And also a little scared. We started by recruiting over 300 injury free runners and measured all the ingredients to our injury recipe during one baseline session. We then track them for injury for 18 months. That's where we're at now. By dividing the initial group up into injured and uninjured runners, we hope to be able to figure out if any of our proposed ingredients to injury are different between the two groups. But why do we want to understand the difference between runners like me and the mics of the world who don't get injured? This research is important for a couple of reasons. First, we know that running injuries affect a large proportion of runners and time loss to injury can have negative effects on both mental and physical health. By knowing the cause of running injuries, 
coaches, physios, athletic therapists and runners themselves may be able to screen for them and hopefully prevent them. Not only does this research have implications for recreational and admittedly fair weather runners like me, but it can also potentially keep higher level runners on the road for longer and prolong their running careers. I'm Sarah Dillon. This is my research. Thank you for listening. This project focuses on athlete burnout in Gaelic games. Despite common misconceptions that athlete burnout is synonymous with overtraining, burnout is actually a psychological syndrome characterized by three key dimensions, physical and emotional exhaustion, a reduced sense of accomplishment or feeling that you're not achieving your goals or potential, and sport devaluation or a sense that your sport doesn't hold the same meaning that it once did. However, while these three dimensions are generally well accepted, we know quite little about their onset and how and why they develop in relation to each other. In addition, although a range of different variables have been associated with burnout, no comprehensive model of the factors impacting the dimensions of burnout over time exists. We aim to fill some of these gaps in the literature through this PhD project. Specifically, we want to improve our understanding of the temporal relationship between the three dimensions of burnout. How do they develop in a specific order? This will enable us to identify what stage of the burnout process an athlete might be at. Secondly, we want to identify the key factors that both predict and protect against the development of athlete burnout. Our project focuses specifically on the experiences of Gaelic Games players. We want to explore the challenges and rewards that these players associate with their sport and how these experiences may relate to feelings of burnout. In-depth insight into players' experiences provides important context for the quantitative data. So why are we focusing on athlete burnout in Gaelic Games specifically? Some initial analysis I conducted as an undergrad points to higher levels of burnout in GEA players compared to data from other sports, and it has been argued that some unique characteristics of Gaelic Games might put players at an increased risk of burnout. Looking at a weekly calendar here, we can see that the training schedule of a player may not look like too much physically, but we must consider the first aspect of Gaelic Games that may make the experience of these athletes unique. Players across all levels are amateur, meaning they must always balance their sport with work and or study commitments. Secondly, Gaelic Games players are often required to represent multiple teams simultaneously, such as club, college, county, playing both hurling and football, again meaning they must balance further commitments. In addition, the lack of a designated off-season Gaelic Games means that many players do not get time away from sport throughout the year. Finally, it has been argued that the importance the games hold in Irish society may create a sense of obligation to play. This was highlighted in an existing qualitative project. We can also see it from some examples across the media. But why is understanding burnout in Gaelic games important? We often hear that sport is something that can bring us great joy and be a real positive in the lives of players. However, when athletes start to experience feelings of burnout, their sport can actually start to have detrimental effects, both on and off the field. Burnout is associated with reduced performance levels and dropout from sport, as well as physical illness and depression. Furthermore, because these feelings are associated with sport, sport can't be used as the release or escape it may once have been. We hope this study can improve the understanding of burnout and gated games among key stakeholders, including the associations, players and coaches, and can help to inform interventions aimed at preventing or reducing the impact of burnout in these sports. So we know what we want to do and why we want to do it, but how exactly did we set out to answer our research questions? We designed a study that has a number of key phases. The project began with a systematic review of the literature, through which we aim to identify key factors that have been examined in relation to athlete burnout in team sports specifically. This phase is complete and has now been developed into a paper which we have submitted for publication. The review informed the development of an online questionnaire which included measures of athlete burnout and associated factors, namely perceived stress, sport motivation, sport commitment and motivational climate, as well as a range of demographic variables. We recruited male and female GA players through social media and contact with clubs and county boards. The online questionnaire was then distributed to the same participants at six time points, with the aim of tracking the variables of interest over two seasons. However, one thing we did not plan for, like everyone else, was COVID-19. The initial lockdown in March was announced just three days after we opened the fourth phase of data collection. Although not part of our initial plan, we saw this as a unique opportunity to examine the impact of a complete break from organised sport on athlete burnout and associated factors. We also felt it was important to try and understand how athletes perceived and utilised the lockdown period. Did they view it as a positive or negative? Did they take a break or keep training? We added these additional questions into phase five of data collection, along with our original measures. As such, we were able to stick to our research plan. We have now completed data collection on burnout and associated factors across six time points. We are also now aiming to understand the unique impact of the lockdown on these variables and are currently working on a paper around this. 
We've also recently submitted a paper focused on some of our early quantitative data. In addition to questionnaires, we've also conducted interviews with a number of participants via Zoom with the aim of exploring their experiences of burnout and gated games and further exploring the impact of lockdown. Finally, with data collection complete, we are now working on integrating the findings with the aim of developing a model of athlete burnout over time. I'll leave you with a picture of Ireland lit up by all the GA clubs across the country. We hope that our work can reduce the risk of any light burning out in Gaelic Games players. Thank you for your time. Diane Arbos was a renowned photographer in the late 50s and 60s, and her subjects were mainly the marginalized in the society. Diane used this quote to describe her subjects. A picture is a secret about a secret. The more it tells you, the less you know. For me, the subject of the picture is always more important than the picture. Now, when we look at the women in the sex trade, what do we see? Who do we see? Do we see women, people, human beings? Often the assumption is that women in the sex trade want to be there. They chose to be there. If this assumption is correct, why then do women stay silent even after they've exited the sex trade? Why do they not want to talk about their experiences in the sex trade? In 2015, the then U.S. Secretary of State, John Kerry, said that money should be able to buy a lot of things, but that it should never ever be able to buy another human being. Yet across the globe, people continue to be trapped in modern-day slavery. Women and girls are trafficked as commodities in the sex trade, including here in Ireland. In 20, 2009, the Immigrant Council of Ireland carried out a research of the sex trade in Ireland and found that 97% of indoor prostitution is dominated by migrant women. Analysis of the sex trade carried out by Sexual Exploitation Research Program in 2020 also stated that migrant women continue to dominate indoor prostitution in Ireland. My research is to explore to understand the experiences of migrant women trafficked into Ireland, most of whom end up in the indoor prostitution. The fluidity between being a small good migrant and a traffic victim is sometimes overlooked. Women go quickly from legal or illegal migration in search of a better life for themselves and their families to being trapped in the sex trade, and one might ask, how did we get here? Evidence suggests that globalization created the divide between the developing South and the developed North. It created the winners and losers through structural adjustment program. This led to feminization of poverty, which in turn led to feminization of migration. Narrative interview was used to gather migrant women's stories of their experiences of the sex trade in Ireland and their lives since exiting the sex trade. This was important as it gave women the freedom of telling their stories and what is important to them. Also, the interview was audio recorded, transcribed and has been securely kept to protect the identities of the women due to the sensitivity of the topic and in accordance with ethics. This research is timely as it was solely focused on migrant women and the women were able to tell their stories themselves, which in turn will inform the kind of support services made available to them in their healing and reintegration journey. What do migrant women who have been trafficked for sexual exploitation want. Migrant women want to be believed. They want to be respected. They want to be treated with dignity. They don't want to be re-traumatized through shaming. Thank you very much. I also want to thank both my supervisors, Dr. Mel Duffy and Dr. Rosalind Malcaveni for helping me and assisting me throughout this journey. Thank you.
In the spring of 2020, when COVID struck, DCU responded rapidly and established a COVID-19 research and innovation hub, the purpose of which was to bring together the research strengths and innovation depth of the university to create responses, rapid responses, to the challenges of the pandemic. From conducting independent research to identify the most accurate antibody tests on the market, to developing low-cost tests for COVID-19 and other tropical diseases. The Hub is responding to the challenges in our healthcare sector. With thanks to funding from the Hub and Science Foundation Ireland, we will be soon installing a prototype device to detect COVID-19 in the air in Beaumont Hospital. We'll also be installing a prototype device to detect COVID-19 on hospital surfaces in spring 2021. Our research examines the experiences of 815 first responders who delivered frontline care during the first phase of the pandemic in Ireland. We identified many examples of good practice and also ways to improve the response to the current and to future emergencies. We've shared these with the National Ambulance Service, Civil Defence and Dublin Fire Brigade, where some of the recommendations are already being implemented. By surveying 50 Chief Human Resource Officers, representing some 2.4 million employees globally, we've gained unique insights into how COVID-19 is impacting on the world of work and how those organisations that are responding best to the crisis are doing so. This is now leading to further research on virtual internships that will inform and support companies and students taking part in DCU's Access to the Workplace programme in 2021. Our 20 PE at Home Facebook Live sessions during Ireland's first lockdown saw 20,000 people tune in. The video resources show real families doing the Irish P curriculum in ordinary homes. They're still being used by teachers and parents for homework and are available on the Professional Development Service for Teachers website and skullnet.ie. Misperceptions, rumours and conspiracy theories have done a lot to undermine the scientific consensus around COVID-19. So in order to tackle this, we surveyed over 2,000 people in Ireland and the US and we found that one of the best ways of helping people to correct their misperceptions is by using fellow citizens to report on the scientific consensus. I want to say thank you too to Science Foundation Ireland for uh, some follow-up research on the COVID-19 online Irish Citizens Forum. Science Foundation Ireland is delighted to support these three projects at the DCU COVID-19 Hub. These three projects are looking at things like the Citizens' Assembly, Citizens' Response to COVID-19, monitoring COVID-19 in the air. And research and innovation is really key to understanding COVID-19 and to be able to manage the response properly. I'd like to thank our partners for working with us on these projects, that together we're building a post-COVID world, not as it was, but as it should be and as it could be. Thank you. I will now introduce the finalists from Category 3, that's the video presentations from all years. First we will have Rosa Marina Senant Julian, School of Applied Languages and Intercultural Studies. Then we'll have Taylor Jade Alan Coyle, School of Biotechnology. After that we'll have Freya Desgumpla, School of Theology, Philosophy and Music. Then we'll have Enrica Amplo, School of STEM Education, Innovation and Global Studies. And finally, we'll have Devika Das, School of Electronic Engineering. First of all, why researching violence? Violence against women is a worldwide problem. In the last few decades, society has become more aware of this problem thanks to the global women's movement. Things like the Me Too campaign on social media have helped a lot to make sexual violence against both women and men more visible. Secondly, why violence in prostitution? Prostitution is a very unpopular topic. Over the centuries, prostitutes have been mistreated by society in many different ways. Women have always been put in the spotlight. Most people are happy to believe that they choose prostitution out of free will. Yes, baby, I do this because I like it. Time to go! But poverty and exploitation are often overlooked, so things are more complex than that. 
Women and girls in prostitution can be particularly vulnerable. They suffer many types of violence, but there is a general lack of awareness about how much violence they deal with. Much of this violence comes not only from their pimps, but from their own so-called clients, who have online communities in which they rate women and girls publicly as good or bad prostitutes. A study that interviewed women in prostitution in nine countries showed that violence against women in prostitution included stabbings, beatings, internal bleeding, concussions, broken bones, and traumatic head injuries. <laughs> Time to go. Do you think this is okay? There is little research done on the men that buy prostitution. My aim is to contribute to this line of research by shifting the focus from women to men and explore why do some men buy prostitution and the types of violence they commit. This project will explore the link between the way we raise men and violence against women and the link between prostitution, capitalism and inequality. At the basis of this project is the long-term aim of protecting women's human rights, both in prostitution and in other violent contexts, so that the new generations can be raised in a world with less violence and suffering. Thank you. Pancreatic cancer is one of the deadliest cancers affecting patients in Ireland, with 550 people diagnosed each year. The five-year survival rate is 9%, with a typical survival time of less than six months, showing just how important the discovery of new and effective therapies are. Unlike other cancers, it does not present many symptoms, which means it is usually diagnosed at a much later stage, resulting in only one quarter of patients receiving treatment. Treatment options for pancreatic cancer vary, including surgery, radiation and chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is a treatment which uses drugs to destroy cancer cells. Pancreatic cancer patients are given a combination of various drugs rather than a single drug. One problem patients face is that the drugs only work for a short time before the cancer cells get used to the drug and continue to grow. This is known as drug resistance. The aim of my project is to develop a model of resistance in pancreatic primary cells. Primary cells refer to cells taken directly from a patient. Here, we can see that the cells continue to grow in the presence of these drugs. So let's take a closer look at what's going on. The cancer cells have begun to fight against the drugs, becoming stronger more resilient and influencing neighbour cells to join in. I treat these cells in a similar pattern of exposure as patients. As these cells are treated, I will investigate changes in their appearance and how they respond to different levels of drug. By examining this, I hope to prevent resistance from occurring, an outcome that could be very important as it could prolong the life of pancreatic cancer patients. Post-Enlightenment, as theologians, sought the person of the historical Jesus as opposed to the Christ of faith. Jewish scholars and authors found the space to assert Jesus' Jewishness, depicting him sometimes as a nationalist hero, sometimes as a moral teacher, and sometimes a Jewish martyr. But on the eve of the Second World War in Europe, as two millennia worth anti-Jewish polemic was about to translate into mass annihilation, Yiddish author Sholem Ash, renowned for sketches of life in small Jewish towns and portrayals of Jewish-Christian relations, depicted Jesus as the embodiment of the dissoluble marriage between Judaism and Christianity in what critics refer to as the Christological novels, resulting in a massive backlash from the Yiddish press and loss of readership. Between 1939 and 1949, years of unparalleled turmoil for the Jewish community, Ash published three novels, the Nazarene, the Apostle, and Mary, exploring the Jewish roots of Christianity, thus rendering 2,000 years of Christian anti-Semitism a fallacy. Many Jews declared him an apostate, whose Jewishness was Jesusness, and despite his popularity among English language readers, many Christians accused him of trying to absolve the Jews of deicide. I am Freya Das Gupta, a PhD student in the School of Theology, Philosophy and Music at DCU, and I'm studying Sholemash's fiction to understand why his work faced such criticism. How he, ahead of his time and in a hostile world torn apart by war, envisioned Jewish-Christian dialogue 
and to explore ways in which his philosophy can be applied to contemporary interfaith efforts. Unlike most other studies on the Holocaust that center on the genocide, my work focuses on a lost culture and a dying language in the hope that it will bring out the rich diversity of Jewishness itself, as opposed to its monochromatic portrayal in mainstream discourse, especially in the face of aggressive ethno-nationalism. What is artificial intelligence? Our world is already full of smart robots, self-driving cars, and voice assistants with fancy names. Nowadays, computers can manage massive amounts of information, helping geneticists to study the DNA or doctors to detect diseases, and maybe one day they will know us so well that they can prevent heart attacks or accidents. But how does artificial intelligence work, and what's the price we pay for it? Because, as we all know, there is no such a thing as a free lunch. Hi, my name is Enrica Amplo and I'm a PhD student with Insight Center and the School of STEM Education, Innovation and Global Studies at Dublin City University. With my research in education and public engagement, I'm trying to design a hands-on learning environment to give children and teachers the opportunity to experiment with AI and data analytics, both from a scientific and humanistic perspective. There are many different techniques on which AI is based on, but they all need a huge amount of data to work. Therefore, today, more than ever, data has real and concrete value. With data, we can represent our habits, passions, health, attitudes. However, humans are more than a list of numbers, aren't we? It is key to raise awareness about our rights and duties in the era of big data. It is paramount to empower everyone in understanding the big ideas which underpin AI, not only from a coding perspective, but also from an ethics and equity point of view. Engaging teachers can have a multiplier effect, now and for the future, as they are responsible for educating our children. Today's children will be tomorrow's AI engineers and policy makers who must innovate ethically, aware that behind the machine decision, there is always a human decision. The present generation of scientists are working on automating machines and devices kept in remote locations so that they can work without humans' physical presence. The remote robotic surgery is one example where the physical presence of a doctor is not required at the operation theater. It is a video-assisted surgery that allows a doctor to operate on a patient from a remote location. The key factor in this type of communication is the latency. In this example, latency refers to the time taken for the live telecast of the high-definition video of the operation to reach the doctor and the instructions from the doctor to reach the robot. There is no room for a delay in such critical interactions. Therefore, a successful operation requires a very low latency communication network. In DCU's radio and optical communication laboratory, we are carrying out research in order to develop up communication networks with high data rate and low latency. Our research will assist such high-quality real-time interactions between human and machine with minimum delay. How do we improve our communication link in terms of latency? Traditional communication networks send information in form of radio signals. But as we know that light is the fastest traveling form of energy in the universe, then why not we send the information in the form of light? We use radio over fiber technology where the radio waves are converted to light. They are then transmitted over a glass medium called optical fiber. The radio signal is transmitted through the fiber by converting the electrical signal into light intensities. Sending the signal through the fiber allows us to avoid the noise and delays which would hinder the signal if it was traveling through air. At the receiving end, the light intensities are converted back to electrical signal which can be directly transmitted as a radio signal by an antenna. I want to thank all of the finalists for all of their hard work and patience and telling us about their research. Now the exciting part. I will announce the winners and runners-up from all three categories. First category won the oral presentations from year one. 
Our winner is Christina O'Keefe School of Inclusive and Special Education. And the supervisors are Dr. Sinead McNally and Dr. Anna Logan. And the title of the presentation was Unlocking the Potential of Play for Social Relationships and Learning for Young Children on the Autism Spectrum. And our runner-up is Craig Smith, School of Health and Human Performance. Supervisors Dr. Sarah Jane Belton and Dr. Johan Izartel. And the title of the presentation was Empowering Adolescents to Take Control of Their Health. Now our winner and runner-up in Category 2, Oral Presentations from Year 2 onwards. So our winner of this category is Sarah Dillon, School of Health and Human Performance. Sarah's supervisors are Professor Kieran Moran, Dr. Enda White and Dr. Siobhan O'Connor. And the title of the presentation was Running Towards Injury, Uncovering Why Runners Get Injured. And our runner-up is Kleena McParland, DCU Business School. Supervisor, Professor Regina Connolly. And the title of the presentation, Electronic Monitoring Within Ungarda Chicana. Finally, our winner and runner-up in Category 3, Video Presentations from All Years. Our winner is Taylor Jade Allen Coyle, School of Biotechnology. Taylor Jade's supervisor is Dr. Finbar O'Sullivan, and the title of the presentation was Chemotherapy Resistance in Pancreatic Cancer. Our runner-up is Devika Das, School of Electronic Engineering. Supervisors, Dr. Colin Browning and Professor Liam Barry. And the title of the presentation, Radio Over Fibre Enabling Futuristic High-Speed Technologies. Congratulations, everyone. So now I conclude the eighth Telestrate final. I hope, like me, you have enjoyed today's session. I certainly did. So I'd like now to thank all of the finalists for their participation and to the supervisors. To thank the shortlisting and judging panel. To congratulate again the winners and runners-up from each category. The winners and runners-up will be emailed separately to arrange the distribution of their prizes. Thanks to all who tuned in to watch the broadcast of this event. Hopefully next year we will be together in a face-to-face -face event. So bye from myself and the DCU Graduate Studies Office team.